Take your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 3. 1 Samuel, chapter number 3. The title of the message is, He Heard God. He Heard God. 1 Samuel, chapter 3. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate our guest. Uh, we're honored to have several with us today. I think Ms. Cheryl got the Travel the Fathers Distance to Come Award. And uh, always glad to have her and the kids come by to visit with us from time to time. I'm not sure if they're coming to see us or Grandma and Grandpa, but they're coming this way, so we'll just take the, the visit and be grateful. 1 Samuel chapter 3, let's start reading in verse number 1. It says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And Samuel was laid down to sleep. But the Lord called Samuel and he answered, Here am I. And he ran into Eli and said, Here am I for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lay down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Again, the title of the message is, He heard God. If you were raised in church, you've probably heard this particular account numerous times. If you're an adult and only came recently inside the Lord's house, you will probably recognize immediately the power of this Bible passage. It shares with us a truth that some folks seem not to know. That is that God not only can call and save adults, God can save and call children as well which is a most blessed knowledge to have. I don't want to speak about this as much as God calling a child today, though, as I want to draw out some similarities between the time that we live in and God and Samuel and the time that he lived in. Again, the title of the message, He Heard God. Let me share several thoughts with you if I could. First thought I would give you is these are those days. These, the days that we live in, are the same as those days, the days that Samuel lived in. It's always impressive to me how applicable the Bible is today, even though it was written literally thousands of years ago. Much of the same things that were happening in Samuel's day are the type of things that are happening in our day, such as what? Well, in Samuel's day, there were some sad things going on. In Samuel's day, there were some bad things going on. In Samuel's day, there were some needful things going on. It's not hard to see those kind of things in our world today. All you have to do is just look around. In order to see them in the Scripture, we need to look at some different Bible passages. So let's spend a few moments this morning looking around at the Bible and see what kind of world it was like that Samuel was born into. First, let's take the man Eli. Eli was a great man of God. He was a good man, a godly man. However, the Bible in this section indicates to us that he had in some ways drifted away from the Lord. You're at 1 Samuel chapter number 3. If you wanted to take the time to read down at verse number 13, you'd find out that God actually rebuked the man Eli. He rebuked him because he had not raised his children the way God told him to raise his children. Now before you get too confused about that, let me say, he didn't tell uh, Eli to raise his kids 
any differently than he's told us to raise our kids. Uh, God teaches us throughout the scripture that we are to teach our kids how to behave and that they are to learn to trust the Lord and obey the Lord. Yet Eli, though he was actually the high priest of Israel in those days, 1 Samuel 3.13 says, he restrained not his kids. Now, I don't know if that bothers you or not, but it should bother you. What that means is, though Eli was a good man and a godly man, he lived one way in the church, and he lived another way at the house. In other words, he was willing to do what God told him to when he was in the temple and the tabernacle serving God. But when he got home and he was dealing with his own family, he didn't do what the Bible told him to do, what God told him to do. Might I point out any time the man of God, the people of God, are living one way in the world and one way at the church, that's a sad time. That's a bad time. That's a needy time. Well, the Bible doesn't just stop there. It goes on. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse number 12, tells us about his two sons. Their names were Hophni and Phinehas. Now, remember, Eli was the high priest during these days. There wasn't a temple yet. There was a tabernacle. It wasn't in Jerusalem yet. It was in Shiloh. But he was still the high priest over Israel. And the way the high priest became the high priest was, it was passed down, that privilege, that responsibility was passed down from father to son. Aaron had passed it down to his son, who had passed it down to his son. And right on down it had come to Eli, and now it was supposed to be passed to one of these two sons of Eli, Hophni or Phinehas. But 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse number 12 tells us that they were very bad young men. Well, that shouldn't surprise us. I mean, if you don't raise children right when they're young, there's no reason to expect them to turn out right when they're grown, right? I mean, if you're not going to do what God tells you to do when you got them around the house, the little ankle biters, why would you expect them to grow up to be good godly folks when they become adults? Bible tells us in chapter 2, verse number 12, two sad things about Hophni and Phinehas. It tells us first that they were sons of Beliah. Beliah. That means sons of the devil. Hey, these are the preacher's kids. But God says they're sons of Beliah. And then it goes on to say, and they knew not the Lord. Well, what does this mean? <laughs> well, that means we've got Eli, a good man. I don't want to throw mud on Eli, but he's got some inconsistencies here. He's not doing what he's supposed to do when it comes to serving God. However, what, with him being drifted from the Lord, his sons aren't just drifted from the Lord. The Bible says they don't even know the Lord. They're living like little demons live. We've got some problems in Israel in these days. It's a sad time. It's a bad time. It's a time when some spiritual needs aren't being met. But then it gets actually just a little bit worse because there's one bright hope for Israel during this time. We're looking at the leadership in the house of God, the temple, the tabernacle, and, and Eli has drifted and his sons aren't even in the ball field, but there is Samuel. Bible describes him as being a child right now. Verse 1 and verse 8 use that term of him. He's the child. Doesn't give us his exact age, but typically in the Jewish culture, a child is referred to as, as a, a, as a, a would you call him an infant, as a boy, as a girl, who has now been weaned, but they're about 13 years of age. Somewhere between being weaned and 13 years of age would be the age of what you would call a child. But the Bible refers to Samuel twice as a child, but verse number 7 tells us of him that as of yet, he doesn't know the Lord. And as of yet, the word of the Lord has not been revealed to him yet either. Now, I don't want to make more of that statement than what we need to make out of it because the truth be known, we're all born in the same condition. We're all born lost. We're all born separate from God. We're all born not even realizing how far from God we are. But we've got a problem here. The problem is Eli is not doing what he's supposed to do in his own home. 
Hophni and Phinehas aren't anywhere near living like they ought to be living. And Samuel right now, still a child, but he doesn't know God yet. And he can't know God unless somebody wakes him up. Unless somebody causes this young child, Samuel, to have a thirst for God, to have a desire for God, to want to draw near God. It doesn't look like Hophni and Phinehas are going to do it. It doesn't look like Eli is going to do it. So by the good grace of God, God steps in to do it. But we're at the crossroads. We're looking at the land of Israel. And everything we're seeing about the leadership of Israel, the religious leadership of Israel, all of it implies it's a sad time. It's a bad time. But not only does the Bible give us some indications about what Israel is like and their leadership, it gives us some other indications about what it's like in the rest of the verses. For example, back up in verse number one, the Bible says, and the word of God was precious in those days. And there was no open vision. What does that mean? Well, to say that the word of God is precious is to say that it's rare. There was no new word from God coming out, at least not to the whole nation during that time period. Maybe God would speak to some individuals, and that's good, that's good. God loves to speak to godly men and to godly women, and he loves to go inside the home and teach mom and dad the words of God and, and let them be the high priest of their home. But we don't just need the word of God inside the Christian homes. We need the word of God inside the whole nation. But the Bible says during these days, the word of God was precious. It was rare. It was a unique treasure. It wasn't happening very much. And it goes on to describe there was no open, no public visions. During the, well, we really shouldn't be too surprised by that, I don't suppose. Who was the man that was supposed to be delivering those messages? Who was the man who was supposed to be speaking to God? Well, it was Eli. But we know Eli is being rebellious to God on at least one area of his life. He's not doing what God told him to do concerning his kids. And again, I don't want to throw mud on Eli. He was a great man of God. He was the judge of Israel. He was the high priest of Israel. But you've got to understand something. You can't be rebellious and disobedient to God in just one area of your life. It don't work that way. If you're going to disobey God in one area of your life, you're going to wind up, it's going to spread throughout all of your life. Why? Because you can't control disobedience. You can't control rebellion. The very nature of rebellion is it don't mind very well. The very nature of disobedience is it doesn't do what it's told. You say, well, I'm just going to rebel against God about this. Oh, no, you won't. It'll run out over in the other areas of your life. It will overflow, spill out. And so far, Eli's not doing a very good job at staying close to God. He seems to be drifting from God. And now God can't use him to speak the word of God to the people of God. I'm reminded not just of what's taking place in Samuel's day. I'm reminded of what's taking place in our day. You know, there's not much open vision. There's not many open messages to the people. There's still churches where God speaks. There's still homes where God's presence is. But I'm thinking about our country. I tell you, our country is hungry for the Word of God right now. The Word of God is precious these days. It's rare these days. There is no open vision right now. He's still speaking in a few places. He's still speaking in a few homes. But let's face it, the kind of people that we have in a lot of our pulpits, the kind of people that we have in a lot of our elected positions, just don't give God an open format so that he can speak to the nation in a lot of needful ways today. What do people do? What do people do when there is no open vision? What happens to a nation when the word of God becomes rare? Two things happen. Number one, the wicked get more flagrant in their wickedness. If there's nobody preaching to the nation, if there's nobody standing for God in the nation, then the evil become more blatant 
in their sins. They become more open in their disobedience to God. They become more arrogant in their sinfulness. Toward. You see that in our world today? You see how people today have no reverence for God, no respect for God? Why? It's because the word of God has become rare in our society today. There is no open vision. When that happens, the wicked get quite arrogant in their ways. But it also has an effect on the saved. The saved get quite hungry when there's no open word of God, when there's no open visions. I think one of the reasons why so many fads are popping up into our churches today is because the people of God are hungry. They want something from the Lord. They want God's message. They want God's refreshing spirit. They want to feel their God. I think one of the reasons churches today are trying so many new things is because they so desperately want to hear from God again. Could I just tell you? God doesn't care for fads. God doesn't care for new things. Listen, we don't need to reinvent religion. We don't need to reinvent church. What we need to do is to go back to the things that God's told us to do. Well, what, what things do we need to go back to? Well, the Bible makes it very clear. We need to start praying and fasting again. Hey, if you want a fresh word from God, if you want a refreshing from God, get back on your knees before God again. Start praying to the God of heaven. Don't need entertainment. We need more time before the Holy Father again. I might add, we need some repentance again. We don't just need to be talking to God. We need to be confessing to God. I'm not sure any of us, myself included, spend nearly enough time telling God what a wretch we are. Reminding God that we need His mercy. Reminding God that we need His refreshing. I think we need to pray. I think we need to fast. I think we need to repent. And then I think we just need to stay before Him. Wait on the Lord. I came in and got saved at, at kind of a strange... I, I, I came in and got saved as things were transgressing or, or, or changing, tra transferring. Things were changing from the, from the old way to the new ways. But I remember when I was first saved, I'd hear people talk about praying through. Getting down on their knees and staying before God until God showed up. I don't know that I've ever seen anybody practice that. Get down and get along with God and just stay with God until you know God has heard your prayer, till you feel the Spirit of God moving, till you know God has said, I've got this. But I'm going to tell you, we need to get back to the old way. God's not impressed with the new ways. We need to get back to the old ways. Praying, fasting, repenting, and just staying on our face before God. Bible is describing the condition of the way it was in Samuel's day. He was born in a day when the word of God was rare, when there was no open vision in those days. The leadership, the spiritual leadership, had drifted away from God. And there was no open word. The Bible also says something in verse number 2 that I find ignorant, uh, interesting. And, and again, I don't want to read too much into it. But I think it's another commentary about Samuel. It, it talks about his eyes dimming and he could not see. Now, uh, I, I understand that, that Eli now, he's an old man. And, and you know, time, time's not most of our friends. Time has a way of diminishing our abilities. And, and Eli now has gotten old and, and the longer he uses his eyes, the harder it is to see. And, and, and it was about time to go to bed and his eyes were getting dim and physically he just couldn't see. But I'm wondering if that's not also an indication of what had happened to him spiritually. You know, it's kind of a shame, but I've noticed, and I don't mean to be ugly, but I've noticed sometimes the ones in the church that have been saved and ought to know better, time seems to be becoming their enemy. And instead of them doing for God, they seem to be drifting away from God. It's almost like their spiritual eyes have become dim and they're just not seeing things like they used to see things. It's like time has become our spiritual enemy. Now, 
I see this. I see it sometimes in our church. I see it a lot of times in the world that we live in. People, when they're first saved, they, they seem to get excited about God and they want to do things for God. But at some point, they just want to start laying aside all the things that they've done all of their life as if it's time to quit serving God and to retire on God. I'm not the bar- smartest fellow. I'm not the brightest guy in the box. I'm, I'm not the brightest bub. In the, I'm not. But one thing I've understood from the beginning, hey, this thing of Christianity, there is no retirement from this. There's a promotion. There's a promotion. Once you get to the end of life, you get promoted in the presence of God, and then you'll get you some other duties to do, some other things to perform. But listen, if you know who God is, you shouldn't be puttering out on God. Uh, You might change some of your roles. Some of your responsibilities might change with age and with physical infirmities and and with different changes in life. Some things might change, but God's never called us to sit on the sidelines. I don't care if you're 20 and sitting or if you're 75 and sitting. God's never called anybody to sit on the sidelines. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Christianity is a get on the tarmac sport. It's the, it's, the, it's the ministry of Christ that we're involved in. Somewhere, somewhere, Eli's eyes had become dim. And he wasn't seeing physically like he once did, but he wasn't seeing spiritually like he once did either. Could I just say one more thought? You can be just excited about Jesus after you've been saved 20 and 40 years as as you were when you had only been saved for 20 or 40 minutes. You remember how excited you used to be? Man, I just just got saved. I got to go tell somebody about Jesus. Uh, We need to to get this message. So I've got some folks that need to hear about Jesus. You remember how excited you were when you just got saved? Listen, you can be that excited after you've been saved 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, and you really ought to be. The Bible describes in verse number one, the word of God was precious and rare in those days. It describes in verse number two that Eli's sight had dim. And then it describes in verse number three, all of these, these are those days. It describes in verse number three, that Eli and Samuel both had laid down for the night, and ere the lamp of God go out. And before the lamp of God. And then he specifies it was the lamp that was before the ark of the covenant goes out. In other words, they're laying down just before the light, the candlestick that's before the ark of the covenant goes out. But there's a problem with that. Exodus chapter 27 tells us that that candlestick that stood before the Ark of the Covenant, it was to never go out. As a matter of fact, the high priest, Eli, was to go in and take care of that candle. It was really an oil lamp, but he was to go in both in the morning and in the evening so that that lamp would burn continuously. That lamp was to never go out. But the Bible says in verse number 3, just before air air just before the lamp went out Eli went and lay down and Samuel was now wait a minute if they're going to lay down who's going to keep the candle going Uh, Eli's an old man he can't see that well if he's going to lay down he's not going to get up at 2 a.m. and go refurbish that candle Samuel's just a little kid who's going to wake him up to go to Hophni and Phinehas they're certainly not going to get up in the middle of the night and go to something bad's about to happen here the lamp of God is about to but God said don't let that lamp See, that lamp was important. That lamp represented the presence of God. God's presence, like a light, fills every nook and every cranny. You know, you turn on a light, and it goes everywhere. That's the way God's presence is. God's presence, if he's in Israel, he's everywhere. He sees everything. He is the light. When Jesus said, I am the light of the world, he was pointing back to this lamp before the Ark of the Covenant. They understood, we don't lose the light of that lamp. When that light goes out, that light that's before the ark, that's like saying God's left Israel. God's gone. We don't have the light anymore. 
Something bad's about to happen. Something sad is about to happen. Somebody needs to do something. Why? The lamp's about to go out. I think that's God's way of saying we're at a crossroads here. We've got a priest who's drifting. His two kids aren't drifting. They're gone. Samuel, he doesn't know God yet. It's just about time that the presence of God is going to depart from the nation of God. The light is about to go out. Could I say, in our country today, if the light's not about to go out, it's already out. Because we're in bad shape today. We're in a needful condition today. We're in a sad situation. Just want you to get that these days are those days. We're reliving the same thing that took place back in the days of Samuel. First thought, these days are those days. Second thought, ours is that God. Ours, our God, is the same God that was there in that day. Uh, this text that we're reading, these first 10 or 11 verses, they don't talk much about God. They spend more time talking about Eli and Samuel. But one thing I see as I read through these verses about God is that in this chapter, even though Eli has drifted, even though Hophni and Phinehas is gone, even, even though Samuel doesn't know anything yet, God's still calling people. And God's still trying to work in the land of Israel. I mean, look at what takes place in this chapter. Uh, Samuel doesn't know. Eli's not doing it. Hophni and Phinehas aren't doing it. So here comes God. In the middle of the night, God starts calling Samuel. Samuel. He doesn't do it once. He doesn't do it twice. He doesn't do it just three times. The Bible records four times before Samuel finally answered it. What's taking place? God is still calling. God is still trying to do something in the nation of of Israel. Now, things are bad. The lamp is about to go out. But it appears to me that God keeps calling. God keeps working all the way up to the moment that judgment begins. Uh, they're close to it right now. They're, they're right on the precipice of, of the light going out and judgment beginning to fall. But there's God. And He's still calling. There's God and He's still trying to put a man in the gap. Sounds to me like that's a pretty good God. By the way, our God is that God. He's the God who just doesn't give up. He keeps on calling. He keeps on trying to put people in the place to help the cause of God. He keeps trying to put people in the place to bring repentance, to bring revival. God is our God. Same God then, working the same way today. The Bible gives us many examples of how God just keeps right on working all the way up to the end. Uh, I was reading. Do you remember back in the book of Genesis chapter 4? Cain and Abel. You, you know, Cain was the first murderer. His brother Abel was the first murdered. And the Bible records that in the book of Genesis chapter 4 and verse number 8. That Cain rose up and slew his brother Abel. But have you ever noticed what took place in verse number 7? The verse immediately preceding the account of the first murder. That's where God asked Cain. He said, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Isn't that interesting? The very verse right in front of the account of Cain slaying Abel is God trying to help Cain. God saying, now, if you'll just do right, don't you know I will accept you? Don't you know, if you'll just do right, you and I can have a relationship. Don't you understand? If you'll just do right, you can have the presence and power of God. And that's God working right up to the very moment that Cain chooses to disobey God and kill his brother Abel. Genesis chapter number 6, Noah on the scene. God tells Noah, I want you to build a boat. I'm fixing to send a flood. My spirit shall not always strive with man, yet 120 years shall be his days. Most people read that verse and they say, well, there's God. He's about to just wipe all the human race off the face of the earth. Yep, that's, that's true. But did you not hear what he said? He said, for 120 years, my spirit will strive 
with man. You know what that means? That means for 120 years, he tried to get more people on that boat. He tried to get people to repent. He sent Noah. He sent others. He says, I'm going to strive with them for 120 years. When was the 120 years up? Well, I don't know exactly, but I'm banking it's about the day that door shut on that ark and the clouds clouded up and it began to rain. You know what, what that means? That means God kept dealing with them, striving with them all the way up to the moment that judgment began. I'm just thinking hours is that God. What God? The God that just doesn't quit. The God that doesn't quit caring. The God that doesn't quit calling. The God that doesn't quit dealing with people. He just keeps on going. Number one, these are those days. Number two, ours is that God. Number three, we are that child. We are that child. Now, this, it's the story of a child. The child's name is Samuel. Again, he's called a child several times. Verse 1, verse number 8. Most people read that story, and, and, and at least they come away with this thought, God is able to use anybody. I hope that's the thought that you get, because we are that child. We are the people that God wants to use today. We are the Samsons. We are the ones that God is calling to. Title of the message, He heard God. Now I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you, as soon as I say, we are the Samsons, you say, just that, well, I'm no Samson. Uh, I, I'm no Samuel. I, I'm not one that God... Can, but do you, do, you, do you realize at this point, Samuel's not Samuel yet. Samuel right now is just a child. As a matter of fact, verse 7 says he doesn't even know God yet. God is trying to get his attention and he doesn't even recognize the voice of God. You see, what happens is sometimes we forget that when God is calling us, he's not calling us as we are now. He's calling us for who he's going to make us into. And right now he's calling Samuel and Samuel doesn't know anything about God but God's going to take this little boy and he's going to make him into the mighty prophet, Samuel. And if God could take a boy that doesn't know anything about God, doesn't recognize the voice of God, doesn't even stop to listen to God, if God could take him and make him into a mighty prophet, what could God do with us? You ever thought God started the entire church with just 120 in an upper room? Just 120. You know, I don't know that we've got it this morning because we've got some folks on vacation, but usually we probably have about 110, 120 in the sanctuary. Same number almost that God started the whole New Testament church with. You ever stop to think, if God did it once, God could do it again. Hey, this is the same God that was alive in Samuel's day, this is the same God that was alive in Peter's day. This is the same God that was alive in Paul's day. We worship the same God. And guess what? We are, we are the same people. You say, well, I'm not a very good person. Maybe you're not now. But look at what God could do with you. First, these are those days. Second, ours is that God. Third, we are that child. Fourth and last, this is where he stood. This is where he stood. If you would look at verse number 10. Verse 10, the verse starts out, And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. The Lord came and stood and called the same way he had done the other times. When I, we just read the other times. We just read it when I started the message. The Bible says three different times God called Samuel, and Samuel jumps up out of the bed, and he doesn't see anybody. Uh, he thinks Eli has called him, so he heads to Eli. Eli, you called me. No, I didn't call you. Go lay back down. It happens three times. Fourth time, he says, this time I want you to stay there. I want you to listen. You know, as you read through the story, you're probably, you're probably thinking, well, God called from heaven. 
I mean, this is God. There's nobody there, right? He just hears the voice. It's like God up in heaven just kind of throws his voice. You know, the trend, the uh, uh, ventriloquist, how do you say that? Ventriloquist, thank you. Uh, those that can throw their voice, they, they put it behind that little dummy. You always think, well, God just threw his voice. He put it in that room. But that's not what the verse says. The verse says in, in verse number 10, God came and stood and called as he had done the other time. God didn't speak from heaven. Where was he at those times when he called Samuel? He was standing beside his bed. But Samuel got up. He heard the voice. But he didn't see God standing there. If he'd seen God standing there, he wouldn't have dared walk past him and gone to Eli in the other room. He'd have stopped and addressed the one that he saw. He couldn't see God, but the Bible makes it clear in verse number 10. He was standing there the whole time. God was standing in the room when he called. Now, wait a minute. That might not mean anything to you, but it means something. It tells us that before we can see God, we first have to hear and respond to God. God never starts by showing himself first. God always starts by calling to you first. You know, I've met a lot of folks in this world, and they want to see God so bad. They want to see God in their life. They want to see God in their circumstances. They surely want to see God in their problems problem is they're not willing to listen to God you do understand God doesn't start by showing himself God always starts by speaking why because faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the word of God how does God always initiate a relationship he always starts by calling now the catch here is you've got to do what Samuel did before you're going to ever see him in your life, in your circumstances, or in your problems. Why? Because God always starts by speaking first. He spoke three times. Three times, little Samuel got up and did the wrong thing. He went to Eli, thinking Eli had called him. Finally, Eli understands what's going on. He says, the next time you hear the voice, don't get up. Stay where you're at. Just stay, wait and listen, and then respond. Say, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Now, Eli was giving him some great counsel there. Uh, he may be drifting, but he gave some great counsel. What was he saying? He was saying before you're going to see him, he was already beside the bed, before you're going to see the Lord, you're going to have to respond properly. What did he tell him to do? Number one, he says, wait on God. Wait and listen. If you want to see God show up in your life, quit telling God what God needs to do. Be nice. I'm going to try to be nice. But keep your mouth closed and listen for God. If you want to see God do something in your, if you want to see God, quit telling him what he needs to do. Just stay where you are. Listen for God. And then when you hear God, don't get up and start doing. No, no, no. Just sit there and respond to God. God, you speak. I'll listen. And there's one more piece of advice. Eli doesn't give it, but I think it's a good piece. I'd stick it in there. Number three, when you hear the voice of God, do what he tells you to do. If you do those three things, if you just wait and listen for the voice of God, if you respond with an obedient heart when you hear him, and if you'll obey God, guess what will happen? <laughs> Next thing you'll know, you'll see God. And what you'll see is he's been standing beside you the whole time. There was never a time he wasn't standing beside you he was there all the time but it starts by hearing God the title of the message is he heard God 
The same God that spoke to Samuel is trying to speak to you today. I don't know what situations you've got. I don't know what problems you've got. I don't know what life you've got. But I'm telling you, the same God that was standing beside Samuel's bed, he's standing beside you right now. And if you want to see him, you'll see him the same way Samuel did. Be still. Be quiet. Listen for him. Yield to him. Obey him. And you'll find out how powerful and how real the presence of God is. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. I thank you for the people to preach too. Lord, I would ask that you take the words that I could not speak and the thoughts that I could not give, and God, that you would complete them in the hearts of the people. And even more, God, you would take your thoughts and your words and bury them deep inside of our hearts and produce some eternal fruit. God, this morning, there's some people that need you. They need to see you. Some need to be saved. Some need to rededicate their life. Some need the fresh breath of God to be blown upon them once again. Lord, whatever the need is this morning, would you make yourself very real and very felt this morning? Do your work, accomplish your will, and we'll try to give you praise in return. For we ask it in Jesus' name.